Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours, the number one live project management radio show in the U.S., broadcasting to you from the Phoenix Business Radio X studio today in Tempe, Arizona. I'm your host, Joe Puzz, PMO Joe, and for the next hour, we'll be talking project management with our special guests. I also want to thank our sponsors, the PMO Squad. PMO Squad is home of the purpose-driven PMO. Most organizations start with the what and how of project management, but with the purpose-driven PMO, the PMO Squad focuses on the why. The purpose-driven PMO empowers people to deliver results. Visit thepmosquad.com to learn more about their purpose-driven PMO. Also, pleased to say next month we'll be adding a new sponsor to the show, PM Master Prep. We're excited to have them join us, and be sure to check out their website, pmmasterprep.com. Also, very excited about the Southwestern Ontario PMI Chapter 2019 Symposium coming up next Thursday, the 25th. Uh, this will be the 16th year for their symposium. Their theme this year is The Future is Now, Connecting Leaders to the Ever-Evolving Project Management. And happy to say I'll be one of the keynote speakers, along with Roger Haskett and Devinder Kumar. I think it's going to be an awesome event, of course. I'm really excited. And uh, also I'll get to get some in-person time with former guest Hussein Banakawala. So visit PMISWOCsymposium.com, PMISWOCsymposium.com to see the great lineup to register, and we hope to see you there. It's going to be really exciting. And for today, we are really excited. We've got two great guests with us. Uh, we have got Todd Williams from eCameron and Dustin Thompson from Keep, formerly Infusionsoft. And I want to welcome both of you today. Welcome, Todd and Dustin. Good morning. How are you? Great. Thanks for having us on. Todd, if you could take a moment or two, please share with our audience a little bit about yourself. So my background is fixing failed projects. I kind of got uh, labeled that back in about 1996, back in the old days. And that's what I do is I kind of run around and find uh, projects that are not running right and step in and try to get them going straight again. It also allows me to, to see what's going on inside organizations and help them develop the right type of infrastructure inside the organization to run projects right to the first time, which is a concept, a novel concept. <laughs> so we don't have to have a failed project. So kind of the project whisperer. Yes. <laughs> and also author of a few great books. I know I've read uh, one of them, Filling Execution Gaps, which is a great read. So excited to talk a little bit about that today as well. Be glad to. And then Dustin Thompson, thank you so much for being with us here in studio. Dustin, if you could tell our audience a little bit about yourself as well. Sure. I am the PMO leader at Keep, formerly known as Infusionsoft. It's a widely renowned tech or, you know, um, company here in the Valley. One thing everyone needs to know about me on the podcast, I'm a stutterer. So I'm part of the National Stuttering Association. Fun little fact about me. Couldn't say a word without stuttering to like the age of 12. And so, <laughs> now, and of course, us stutterers, how we get over stuff is we put ourselves in public speaking situations to make us get over these kind of things. So they're kind of fun. So if you ever hear like, hey, the podcast is breaking up. No, that's just Dustin breaking up. It's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, quite all right. I love it. No, but yeah. So anyways, uh, I'm the head of the PMO over there at Keep, formerly known as Infusionsoft. We, I, I, I want to do one little thing. We were just uh, ranked number one CRM by G2 Crowd, which is awesome. So go my company, Keep. Yeah, we're awesome. Congratulations. We're doing a lot of fun things over there. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm over there. My background is I'm a PMO leader, project leader for a while now, um, really focusing on what you say at the beginning of every single show, the purpose-driven PMO, right? Why we do what we do, not just the what. So many people focus on the what. I'm a big proponent on why we do things. Um, and, you know, just making sure that 
our PMO aligns to the values of the company and their needs instead of like us coming in with our own agenda. We don't play for the back of the jersey. We play for the front of the jersey, right? Yeah. So that's really important to us where we're at, at least all of my people that work for me. That's important to them. Sure. Right? They're going to say that. They're all nodding their heads if they're listening. So They better be yeah. listening. Yeah. Well, thanks, Dustin, for being here. I appreciate uh, both of you, and I think uh, we're going to have a great discussion We've had the past few shows a little bit more about leadership and the soft skills within project management. And today, I think we're really going to dig in deep on PMOs, uh, which, of course, is my passion, too. So I love the topics for today. Uh, Todd, we'll, we'll kind of jump in with you in talking a little bit about the book, Filling Execution Gaps. You had mentioned in there, right, about PMO and not really being understood. Kind of what's the, the backstory on that? What's your thoughts around that? So, yeah, so the book, out there has two chapters on governance and I'm not extremely polite about <laughs> the PMO and where it's at. And I, I get a lot of uh, people ask me, well, geez, Todd, it really sounds in those chapters, if you're, you're talking about semantics and the name of a PMO and in a way I am, but I really am talking about the function and defining and it gets right back to why do we have this PMO and why does it exist? What are we trying to communicate? How do we, when somebody says we need a PMO, what does that really mean? And what are they trying to achieve, right? There's got to be some reason. There's got to be some sort of a why. The challenge, the first challenge I see is that people throw around that acronym, PMO, and they never really define what it means. So you'd be in a room of five people. Someone says we need to do something or we need a PMO or PMO this or PMO that. And if, you know, the five people in the room, there's like eight different definitions of what the PMO or PMO really is. I mean, just look at the P. It could be anything from project to portfolio to process. And and each each letter could be something different. And so my biggest concern and issue is that whenever you have something where you have to have some sort of a, a project governance, that it's properly defined at what it really is. Back to that why. And, and get a good name behind it. If it's really trying to do resources, it says resource. If it says, if it's really trying to do uh, process uh, de definition, then it has something with process in the name. And, and just move away from the acronym completely. I think that's probably one of the biggest issues. Um, the second issue I have in there is too many times I see PMOs that are stepping in to fill a gap where there's lack of accountability by the executives in the organization. And really, we're, they're trying to fill a gap with an organization instead of making the executives and middle managers accountable for what needs to go on. So those are my complaints. And Dustin, we had a little bit of a chat. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think defining what your PMO is there to do is extremely important. Like it blows my mind when I hear that PMOs get started and don't start with that. Like, you know, I wouldn't even be interviewing for a job of what a PMO was without having that conversation about it. So uh, it's been interesting to hear other colleagues and people be like, oh, yeah, we really haven't defined why we exist where we exist. And, and so it, it is crazy to hear. And I'm not a big... I'm not a big stickler on on titles and and what exactly it is. I mean, like for example, I have an EPMO where I'm at, right? But I don't like to box anyone into a very specific corner of what that was defined along, you know, by someone or what it is. I, I think the most important thing is to show up and say, what does the company need from the PMO? Right. Like like why do they need us? Why do they feel like they need us? Right. And then to transform a PMO into really a strong business partner. Right. And say, hey, how can we help achieve the strategic goals of the business, right? I mean, that's why we're there, right? Um, you know, whether that's through methodologies, tools, and standards, or running the biggest projects, or whatever it is, I mean, you got to know your purpose, and then you got to work that purpose, and you got to work the plan, and you have to almost be your own advocate and and exclaim to the world, this is why we're here, and this is what we do. Um, so those are really important things. Um, to your complaint earlier about sometimes executives use this as an excuse to like, hey, I'm going to dump all this stuff on the PMO, right? 
That's interesting, you know, and uh, Todd and I actually had an interesting conversation about that, right? And although I do see that happen sometimes, right, at the same time, I, I'm not a big person about pointing blame of why things don't work, right, because I know that we can only control ourselves, right? So you kind of have to look at a situation and say, this is what the business is saying, right? This is the business needs. And I could go out there and complain. Like I've had leaders and peers who do this all day long. They just basically like tell everyone why they're not successful, right? And I like to turn that around to a challenge. So there's actually a book out there like not problems, but challenges because the challenge you actually stand up for. You face a challenge. You sure. prepare to fight someone on a challenge, right? Yeah. But a problem is like a complaint word. Right. And and so I like to look at things as challenges to be like, hey, if the business is feeling this way, why? Let's go figure out how we can actually provide value and be there the way the business needs to be there, but also challenge them of why they want us to be there that way. So those are some thoughts that Todd and I had talks about earlier. Yeah, I think part of our conversation that we had was a, a, a story I related about one uh, meeting I was in where I had someone in this meeting who said, hey, my boss says that we need to set up a PMO. And I knew the company well enough. I can't say their name, but I knew the company well enough, a multi-billion dollar company, and they had probably eight PMOs already. And this person said, so what should I do in this PMO? How should I go and tell people this PMO is valuable? And they were literally asked by the executive to set up a PMO with absolutely no definition of it. And that's where I think that things really fall apart. And it's back to that executive role of where they're at. And so that's that accountability. And I, and I could see that what was happening in that situation was this, this person was really setting up this, for lack of a better word, scapegoat for whatever things went wrong. And we just go over the PMO and, hey, why did this thing fall apart? Uh, it was it was uh, it was quite ugly. That was the most blatant one. But I've actually worked at a lot of organizations where the PMO ends up being that the scapegoat or abdicating uh, or people are, or executives are abdicating their accountability. And it's it's really quite frustrating. And I think one of the issues I've seen when we go into organizations and help some of this is they do define a charter or a why or a purpose, whichever word is appropriate for that organization, but it's not in coordination with the executive team. So they've self-defined their own existence, therefore report their status about their existence, and the executives are wondering why, because that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. And and the challenges, right, really become in the um, the alignment. And executives dump down to PMOs, usually when there's no upfront coordination to define what they're supposed to be doing in the first place, because they would have defined, we're not going to dump on the PMO. So it's a, an interesting dilemma that sometimes is self-inflicted. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and also, like, to that point, like, I think everyone, if you look, if you Google the term, what makes a successful PMO, and the top three of every article or everything you're ever going to look at, it's going to be executive sponsorship. It's going to be up there. It's one of the top number one things, right? But then I question, whose job is it to get executive alignment and sponsorship? You know, if you're going to lead a PMO and just assume that's going to be there for you, then you're already failing. That's the way I look at it, right? You like there's a, you know, there's a methodology of leading or uh, managing up or leading up, right? Like you have to seek for those things as a PMO leader. And if you're not getting them, you need to make those things happen. You know what I mean? So don't wait around for some executive to be like, I'm just all of a sudden going to sign up to be your sponsor, you know, and lead through this thing. So PMO leaders, if you're lacking that, it's your job to go get it. You know, that's a great point, Dustin. Um, in the in the book, Filling Execution Gaps, that's one of the gaps I talk about is executive sponsorship. And it's not just for the PMOs, but for projects. And many times projects are uh, lacking effective uh, executive sponsorship. I think whenever I was interviewing people for the book, you know, I interviewed a few hundred, about 350, 380 people for the book and trying to make sure that I had everything kind of square. And whenever I brought up the point of executive sponsorship, I routinely got from project managers and people in the PMO that 
executive sponsorship was just broken. Yet when I talked to an executive about executive sponsorship, they thought everything was running just fine. And I was really surprised at the, the stark contrast between those two opinions. And when I drilled into it a little bit further, one of the things that I found is that very, very few companies have actually a definition, like a job description of what an executive sponsor is. So when someone gets that task thrown to them, they don't know what it is. They don't know how to handle it. And what I recommend is you do something really simple. You carry a job description around with you. So if you're in a PMO or you're running a project, you go to the executive sponsor and say, here's kind of what I think that your job role is. What do you think your job role is? Here's what I think my job role is. What do you think of this? And then you actually sit down with them, have that conversation. You start trading things around between the job descriptions and try to look at the weak spots or where there's holes and eliminate some of those questions so you know where that line is and how people are going to work together. And when you have to, to tag an executive sponsor and say, I need help, how do we escalate? Have you ever done that? Oh, oh, yeah. Like you're hitting something that is really important here, and that is the basics, right? Like mm -hmm. so many people, they learn about the basics, they do it through their training or testing or certifications, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's like just really good stuff to know and do. But then a lot of project managers or even project leaders focus on the complicated things, the new model to build, right? The new engagement platform, the system we're going to use, right? But the basics is what makes everything work, right? Uh, I had an employee worth, work with me and I can't, I, I don't know exactly what she said, but she was like, the basics are the best. Like that's how she would say it, right? <laughs> and so many projects she would be so successful because the first thing she would do is put up roles and responsibilities on the, on a deck, on a slide and say, Hey, you're a sponsor. This is what it means. You're a project owner. This is what it means. This is what it means for the project manager. Who's me. You're a functional lead in this group. This is what that means. Right? Like, and every time we did that, we, we had so much more success. In fact, recently, I had a project manager and a project and we kind of took this project and I call it like the project was happening. The train has left the station and they're expecting the manager to get on a horse and jump on the back of the train, you know? Yeah. So it was one of those projects, right? Where you're like, okay, let me catch up with y'all. Right. <laughs> and then we formed the project team and half the people were like a year down the project. They've been doing all this work. Their understanding and level of where they're at the project is like, miles down the road. And then everyone else is just hearing about this, right? And so we tried to have some meetings to get to Bright really quickly. And it was just, it was jumbled and nothing was happening. And I'm like, Rusty, we need to do it. Uh, we need to do a new kickoff. We're kicking off the project all over again and resetting the table, right? The moment we did that, everything sped up so fast. We like accelerated past planning and into execution in an instant, because we were all aligned to what our roles were, what I'm supposed to be doing, what our purpose is of what we're doing, and everyone had clarity and alignment. So right now in our PMO and Keep in general, we have these three C's that we're really focusing on, and that's clarity, commitment, and confidence. And if you can't say yes to those things, then we're doing something wrong. We haven't aligned. We need to do something else. So, yeah, uh, Todd, what you're saying resonates quite a bit there. What I'm wondering, Todd, is reading through the book, and there's a lot of what you have in there that really hits home, right, and total alignment with it. And part of that is the checklist PMO, the governance PMO that's about are we doing it the right way and not are we actually doing it, right? Correct. Can, can you elaborate a little bit more on what your thoughts are on that? Uh, well, I want to make sure that we understand. I, I definitely feel that, that checklists have their place, right? I, I definitely want my surgeon to have a checklist <laughs> to make sure he doesn't leave anything in me whenever he leaves, <laughs> or he leaves pilot, the table, right? right? <laughs> and, and I do feel that they're important. I do think that they actually have an importance in, in project management. However, when you're having a, a governance organization and they're trying to check things off, they have to they have to really look at whether those things are realistic. And I and I have not found yet. Now, a little bit of a caveat in here, right? I, I fix failing projects, so and the and the organizations around them. So, 
nobody ever calls me in when their PMO or their project is running right, right? I, I, I never see the good ones. I only see the bad ones. I see the ones that are falling apart. So I go in and I find a checklist PMO where they're sitting there saying, but have you done this? Have you done that? Did you have this meeting? And it, they're almost every time they're a failure because they're actually people are being mechanical. There's no passion behind it. There's no understanding of why we're doing this. And sometimes there's no reason why they're doing it. It's just, that's what Joe did, you know, 30 years ago. Pardon me. I forgot I had a Joe on the couch. <laughs> on a, on a, I'll, let me pick a different name. That's what Sam, <laughs> Sam did 20 years ago, right? Um, my apologies. And so if, if you're just doing that, it just doesn't work. It's, it, I mean, that old story of, you know, grandma used to cut off the last two inches of the ham because it just wouldn't fit in the pan. You just get a different pan, right? You, you got to get away from from, from those things that just get passed down. Uh, and, and that's a huge problem. I interviewed a company, again, I can't say the name, but they had this corporate PMO that was literally looking at every one of their divisions. Again, multi-billion dollar company. They were looking at each division and making sure that all their projects were aligned to the goals of that division. And I had to ask the person, well, isn't that the role of the CEO or the president of that division? Shouldn't that person be doing it? And it took quite a while before that person had to actually see this problem that they were stepping in to do this other person's work and going through this checklist that really wasn't adding any value at all. In fact, it was probably actually detrimental to how those different divisions ended up executing their projects and keeping them on track. What they also found, I think, when I talked to people inside those divisions, is that the people in the projects knew that this checklist was coming up, so they'd manufacture something in the project so that the PMO would check off the box and not be able to see what was actually going on inside the project, which was important. That was a huge, you know, it, we, we, we do what we are measured to do. Yeah, I had uh, some good experiences within the sales functions of organizations where I was a, a relationship manager, right, working PMO plus sales side. And I never had an instance in any of the sales meetings I attended where somebody said, ah, you should have held back on that sale until you had that checklist item done. We always go get the sale. And in the PMO world, the sale is delivery of the project, right? I don't care about gate two if it's going to get me through to delivering on the CRM system that's going to increase sales 20% next year. And we get caught up in this, and I and I think, and again, I'd love to get the input from both of you guys here, right? The PMO leader oftentimes end up being the most experienced project manager who got promoted into a leadership role, but never got training on how to run a department, how to run an organization. So they fall back to what they did when they were executing a project. Right. And I guess, you know, Dustin, what's your thoughts on that? No, so I, I you're absolutely right. And I actually wrote down a sentence that I shared with Todd because, you know, not a lot of people agree with me on this. But I said, you got to abandon the belief that your methodology fits every company and every project <laughs> and every PMO. It just is not true. Yeah. So if you're like, oh, the PMBOK guide is perfect and I can implement the checklist every single time and every single activity that's within a stage gate or phase gate is so important to do. That's just not true, right? And so, and then what you're, and, and the only people who get that is when they get past being a project manager into a project leader or an innovative project leader, where they look at their methodologies as tools in a toolbox that can be used. But then you pick which tool is the right tool to build that bench, right? I'm not going to use the laser cutting guide for metal to build a bench. Right. Mm -hmm. But oh, it's a great tool and it works and it's industry proven. Right. But you're trying to put in rigor where rigor's not needed. Right. So, for example, my PMOs, we always go, we start with the outcome. Right. So, if you're going to look at the project life cycle or stage gates or whatever you want to call them, right? Ask yourself why we have them in the first place. Right. What's the outcome of intake? What's the outcome of planning? Like, it, and it should be one sentence. It should be like planning. The outcome is that we validated the problems important enough to go fix 
and we think we designed a solution that we could possibly do to fix it, right? Yeah. That's it. And if you could answer that question without eight weeks and five meetings and 12 documents, then let's get past that. Let's let's not document for document's sake a certain template that you have, right? Let's answer those questions and move forward, right? And so that actually brings me to what you said is like so many project managers or PMO leaders were good project managers, but they're not good man- leaders, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm a huge belief in there's so many skills out there that a PMO leader needs to know that's not taught in a lot of our project management training, right? So me personally, sales skills. I A lot of people ask me, really? Sales? And I'm like, yes, you want to be a good PMO leader? Go to a sales training conference. And they're like, what? And there's this really famous story by Robert T. Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad author, if you guys have heard of him, right? Oh, yeah. Where an author attended his conference, and it was so great. She came up to him afterwards, and she's like, I'm writing the you know, the next great American novel. If you can give me any advice, what would it be? And he's like, attend sales training conferences. And she's like, what? I'm an auteur. What are you talking about? I'm an artist. I don't want to learn how to sell, right? And then he's like, well, when you look at the cover of my book, and there's this little uh, seal that says, New York Times best-selling author, what's the key word there, right? Yeah. It's selling, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot lot of people don't get that. You can walk into a book and be an author, and there can be tons of garbage on the shelves Mm -hmm. that are selling, and they've published, right? So what's the difference between those people who write quality work and sell nothing and the people who sell garbage, right? And so they know how to sell, right? (laughs) And so this, this leadership quality of knowing how to sell is so important, right? You're, you, we're selling ourselves constantly. When you go to a job interview, you're selling yourself. When you are leading an organization or department, you're selling the importance of your organization or department, right? And there's, I, 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 I ask PMO leaders, I'm like, so what sales training methodologies do you use or approaches? And no one knows what I'm talking about, right? You know, so like there's so many things and we can get into more like crucial conversations is a great book that helps yes it is it's a great book right uh eq or mindfulness or continuous learning and innovation learning how to say no there's all these things todd and i were talking about but we simply don't think of these things a lot as pmo leaders because your job as a pmo leader is not to become the greatest pmo machine ever it is learning how to become a business leader who just happens to manage the PMO, you know, yeah. uh, org. So, and Todd, I'm wondering, right, as as uh, you know, the project whisperer, right, the guy that's going in and helping organizations that are having struggles. What do you see here with what Dustin was just talking about? Well, a hundred. We this is you know the unfortunate part where I guess where Dustin and I totally agree with one another, and so we don't end up with this spicy conversation where I can you know. We can we can argue about it. I think Todd uh, and I literally spent like ten minutes trying to find out something that we disagreed <laughs> on, so we could have that debate here today. Exactly. Um, you know, the book that I push people on is "Spin Selling" by Neil Rackham, and he. I mean, this is truly one hundred percent a sales book. Uh, spin is an acronym for a situation, problem, you know, implications, and needs payoff, and. The reason I push that book is because it's so valuable for both business analysts and project managers. And I really try to require my business analysts to read this because the questions that are in that spin selling book and that that process of going down that that spin route, those that acronym route, is that you're really drilling down not to just the actual implication of the problem where you're starting to get down to the root cause, but then that last part is what's the needs payoff. You're actually now able to prioritize that based on some sort of value to the organization, which gets you right back to the point of are my projects, is, are, my, are my project offices, are the people in my organization through their projects providing value? And so you get right down to that core justification of value, not scope, schedule, budget, but words that executives understand and, and, and at the lowest level. So you're getting down to the, to the architects and the business analysts and these people who are going out to the customer, to the end user and saying, 
what is it that you need? And they'll come back with, this is what I want. And they continue to hone this down till finally they get both the customer and the project pointing at the needs and not these wants that are trying to address symptoms, but they're, they've actually drilled down far enough to find the causes. That's all sales, 100% sales of trying to get people to go down a road that you need them to go down. And if you don't have that, you're not there. I mean, a leader is it has a vision and you have to sell people on that vision. And if you can't sell people on that vision, you aren't going to make it. So you as a project manager and a leader, better know sales, 100%. This is one of those times where I wish we weren't a radio show, right? Because if we were a like a video right now or television or something, we could put up on screen like the big star, everything, sell, sell, yeah. flashing, right? <laughs> on, on radio, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll try to make sure that that stands out. I mean, it, it's so true uh, that that's a key component. But again, when you're promoting project managers into leadership roles because they're good PMs and not good leaders, they miss out on some of these skills, right? And I think that's where we, that's why we have the show, right? To go out there and share with them our industry to help uh, those in need. And and part of that selling, right? When I think back is to the discussion we've had so far is how PMOs are kind of structured today and how they're organized and what what has become standard, right? And, And Todd, you talk a lot about there's different types of PMOs and everyone's bought into them, but are they the right ones? Right. What's your thoughts there? Yeah. Well, again, I'd like to get away from that acronym of PMO and and say what or why are you doing this thing? One of I just wrote a a blog post. I put it on LinkedIn. I think it was yesterday. And it pointed to some research done by a guy by the name of Donald Saul. And he is looking at things of, of why there's gaps and what type of gaps there are in organizations. And the headliner on that is that one in five managers cannot, or sorry, 45% of managers cannot name one out of five of the major companies' goals, right? So they can't even, they can't even, they don't even know where the company's going, right? And this result, as you drill, drill down through it, gets to a point where you don't have the right kind of people in the right spot. People are being reviewed and promoted on what they do individually and not what they do as a team or how they collaborate or how they build the organization. And if there is a tool that could help is to have some group that looks at how people are being brought up through the organization, not just in project management, even in functional areas and say, what is your leadership specialty? How are you going to become a leader? I mean, we just got through saying people get promoted into these PMO slots and they don't really understand what leadership is. What would have happened if all of a sudden we had some group that, that wasn't just an HR training group that had a little more meat than that, supported by uh, you know, the CEO, that really just focused on you need to have leadership if you're going to get to this next step. Here is, here's a set of things you're going to have to do and demonstrate, not just checkbox, but demonstrate that you can actually be a leader, that you have those traits, that you're, you're expanding your horizons. You have an understanding of how to coach people, how to, you know, when you have to be directive, when you have to coach, when you have to engage, when you have to have consensus and be able to move through those slots. Because as project managers and to a large extent, PMO managers, we're situational leaders. And we're, we, we go from meeting to meeting to incident to incident where we have to be a different type of leader and do something different. So what if we had that ability to implement some training and get people to be better leaders? That would be a huge value to almost every single company. Yeah, and I, I like how you had mentioned too, right, earlier talking about the multiple definitions of PMO, right? Project management, program management office, portfolio. Just having an inconsistent naming convention leads to confusion, right? Right. And and as Dustin mentioned earlier, right? I mean, a lot of folks walk out of company X into company Y and think they can do the same thing, but the other company has a completely different definition. Had a play on words, right? With our purpose-driven PMO, we said PMO stands for purpose, measure, optimize. Because if we define the why, we can then measure, are we hitting it? And if we're not, we're going to optimize to make sure we do. So forget about all this 
project program portfolio process product whatever it may be <laughs> and just go purpose measure optimize simplify it yeah if you don't mind me saying one more thing on it you know in the book i think i highlight 11 different major pmo types that i ran across and and i think nine of those came from the definition of what a PMO is in PMI's terms, right? So this came straight out of their documents on talking about PMOs. It's like, how can you talk about PMOs and then have nine different purposes for them? And I found another two or three that were pretty important. And I'm sure there's others. I, I'm sure that I could go find someone else to talk to that would also have another definition. That is so fundamental that that you know you just can't, I, I, I have a hard time grasping why people haven't backed away and looked at that and said, okay, let's really focus on what these things really mean and and start calling them something different so we set expectations. Uh, it's huge. So I think we should talk about why this confusion happens. And I have this thought that no one really cares about our terms except for project professionals, Right. Like we, we like if I go ask my VP of sales and VP of partners and VP of marketing, I'm like, hey, I'm the PMO leader. They're like, what's PMO stand for? We have to get out of our heads that our stakeholders or our customers even really care about all of our terminology and all of our things. Right. Like we as, you know, project managers and PMO leaders, we care. Right. But they don't. They could care less. Right. So I'm very much a proponent of simplifying things, right? And saying, hey, we as a project management office team, let's get clear on what we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. But then how do we actually go have a talk track and, a, and we can pass the elevator speech with someone in the elevator without using terminology that no one knows or understands, right? Now, some people do, right? A really good vice president of operations knows what a PMO is, right? At least I would hope so, or that would be scary, right? <laughs> or a C. You'd be surprised. And, and, and it's true. It happens all the time. So, like, we, I think the one thing, the first step is we as project management professionals have to get out of our brain that you people care that much about your career and the things that you've learned, and then that's valuable to them. Half the people on my project team don't even know what PMI is, right? You know, they don't even know what PMBOK is, right? And when I say a raid log, over their head doesn't mean anything to them, right? So like when you come from that perspective of building a team, training the team how we're going to manage, you have to put it down to a level that's common language, right? So uh, define your PMO, get that there, but then, uh, you know, exclaim it to the company and your leaders in a way that resonates with them, right? That's just so important when trying to define your why. So, Dustin, uh, this makes me think of a little anecdotal thing I do. I do a lot of mentoring uh, for for people and uh, a significant amount at the college level. So as people are going through college, getting their degrees and moving on, and I've got two local schools here, Washington State University, Vancouver, and the University of Portland, where I, I have a number of students. And, I, and they're always coming up to me and they're saying, oh, man, I got to make a decision on what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I spend a little bit of time saying, hey, that's going to change. Don't worry about it. <laughs> But they'll, I'll ask them, I'll say, you know, they'll say they want to go into project management and I'll ask them, OK, so what is it you want to do when you grow up? Do you want to be do you want to have uh, do you want to be a CEO or is it you want to continue maybe going up the ladder a little bit, uh, managing a few people and you don't want to have that that great responsibility of a CEO? You don't want the flamboyance of it. And, you know, if they say they want to be a CEO, I'll say, ah, don't go down project management route. Because no CEOs are project managers. What are the project manager? The CEOs come from operations or sales and marketing. And probably, if you want to be a CEO, go into sales and marketing because they seem to make it up that route. The point here is those people at the top of the organization that are really driving things and, pr uh, and, and pushing things, they don't understand our language at all. They don't see it. They don't. There's just this. There's a huge gap there on what they actually see. And, and even though it's a bit of an over uh, uh, dramatization of of there are no CEOs, I'm sure that some listener out there is saying, oh, I know one. <laughs> the point is still there. 
that it's very rare and their language barrier is huge. So PMOs and, and you know, uh, racy charts and all that stuff. Yeah, right. They don't care. Not only do they not care, they don't even know what the, the, the phrase means. And they just look at you as a technician and you need to change that language to get into their language. So you're talking their language completely. You know, you had mentioned mentoring. So every time somebody uh, that's a guest on the show does that, I have to pause for a commercial break to be able to talk about the veterans mentoring program that the PMO squad and Vets to PM has partnered to put together. We just kicked off our most current wave. So if you're a veteran looking to transition into civilian project management space, or if you're a project manager who wants to mentor veterans looking to transition, please go out to the PMO squad website up on the uh, top menu, select Veterans Mentoring Program, uh, the VPMMA, Veterans Project Management Mentoring Alliance, and uh, you can go out there and help make a difference for a veteran trying to make that transition. I just saw that this morning, or maybe it was yesterday, Joe. I uh, hadn't seen it before. Uh, I apologize because <laughs> I should have seen it, but I, I, that is fantastic what you're doing. It's wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I agree. Mentorship is just an underplayed, so important thing that we all need to do. Um, we all need to engage in. And the fact that you're providing to veterans and one of my favorite people in the world is awesome. So kudos. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Todd, I want to go back to, you had said something earlier in the show about project success and uh, value, right? And and not so much scope, budget, and uh, schedule. And that reminded me, we had when Harold Kersner was on the show a few episodes back, he had talked about that, that the, the, when we were talking of the future of project management, everyone is eventually going to align on the fact that you only measure project success one way, and that's did you provide the value you intended to at the beginning of the project. So how do we do that? How do we as PMO leaders or consultants going in to help organizations, how do we help them get to that point that that's how they're measuring and that's what they're providing value back to their organizations. It's spending a lot of time with the customer and the end user um, who's paying the bill and, and, re and reconciling those differences. Because what you'll find is the end user may have one set of, of value characteristics. The, the customers or end users uh, superiors may have another and if you're running a project that's external to your company, let's say you're a uh, system, uh, system integrator or something like that, there's value to your company. So there's a whole bunch of different people who see different types of value out of the project. And you have to put those all together and, and reconcile those and figure out which is the set of values you're going to achieve, right? And, and have a very open conversation saying, hey, this stakeholder wants this, this stakeholder sees this is value, and this stakeholder sees this is value, where are we going to sit? And then explain to some of those stakeholders, this is why you're not going to get this piece of value because we don't have the money <laughs> to provide everything. And so you work that in an open, extremely transparent situation so that people have the proper expectations set. OK, and if you don't do that, you're in trouble. And uh, man, we can see projects all over the place that delivered to scope, schedule and budget and no one ever used it. Right. IT projects are a classic example. And then we can see things that went over budget and there were just a heck of a mess. <laughs> and they're all of a sudden massive value. And how does that how's that balance? It, it's people always looking for where things need to be in the value and trying to understand what it is and set those expectations and go back and say, yeah, I know we're going to spend more money or we're going to spend less money. Or we're going to do whatever, but this is where we get the value. Yeah. So I think we've probably all experienced this before where project managers, maybe were concerned with budget, but the organization is really concerned with timely delivery of the service. Mm -hmm. So they're mm -hmm. willing to go over on budget to hit their timeline. And, and we're sitting there going, oh no, I've got to mark the project red because we're over budget. And the organization's thinking, spend, 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 baby. I got to get this project out so we can be first to market. Uh, and the mindset of what you just said, right, Todd, is get to know your customers and understand what they're really looking for and value out of your project. And I think it's really important to, I mean, I, I have this very firm opinion that if a project isn't increasing revenue, sales, saving us money, um, increasing efficiencies, then why are we doing it? 
right? So when we talk about value delivery, we got to talk about the ultimate value. You know, like those are the things that companies and CEOs care about, right? Our board of directors approves budgets for the PMO even to exist to help us increase revenue, There's, you know, on those type of things, right? So it's like when we don't even think at that level, and a lot of PMO leaders don't, we don't think at that level, right? And we think of a budget as like, well, I don't understand everything behind this, but in order for us to implement this new tool or software, I need this budget, right? I think it's a disservice to ourselves as project management professionals to not connect those dots, right? And so when I align a project to what value it's going to deliver in the end, it aligns to those things, right? Revenue, sales, and those kind of things. But this is what happens in a lot of companies, right? We get really amped up about the new thing, right? We go do planning and we get everyone and we form a team and we execute and then we deliver. But by the time we're delivering and implementing, there's like a new fire or new shiny thing in the company and we kind of forget about that delivery and it's just like it's implemented and it's silent and no one talks about it, right? And very few people actually go back and collect success metrics to say, hey, how did that impact revenue, sales, and all those type of things? Because we're so focused on the other stuff, right? So I think it's a very valuable exercise to collect sex, you know, success metrics and say, hey, this is how this thing impacted the business, right? And then we have to share those wins, right? No one else is going to share the wins besides us, right? But when you share those wins and we show how it actually how we contributed to the company's goals, that's powerful. The other thing I wanted to add to this is a lot of project professionals think closing the project early is a dirty sin, right? That means it was failure, right? But a lot of times, Project planning is to determine whether we should go forward and justify the cost of the value that we're going to get, right? So there have been a few projects recently where we intentionally, after planning, said, no, we're not going to do this. It's too much cost for the value it's going to deliver. And so we're going to do a different thing. We're going to fix process instead of implement a new software or something, right? And when, and a lot of people were like, Oh, I kind of feel bad. My project closed early. We didn't even get to execution. And I'm like, no, you're thinking about this totally wrong. High five. You just saved the company. Let's just say a hundred thousand dollars a year, right? That's huge. We should celebrate those things. That's right. So, and where before we were just spending like crazy and implementing $100,000 softwares all day long that never delivered the intended value. That is what should be looked down upon, right? Not that, oh, we did some good rigor up front to determine if this is even going to give us the value. You know, and some of those things, Dustin, are you're talking pretty much tangible items such as, you know, cost. Some of the value is not tangible. I I can give two quick examples, I think. Um, One was a project I worked on uh, 15, almost 20 years ago. And they called me and said, hey, this thing is a mess. Come in here, fix it. And I ran all the numbers. I did everything I was supposed to do, <laughs> come up with this with a, a, a success matrix. And, and the numbers all pointed to canceling the project. This was a system integrator who was working for a company outside the country and to overseas. And I said, look, if you guys cancel this project now, you're going to end up losing about a million dollars. If we continue to run this project, you're going to lose somewhere between three and four million dollars. So the numbers, and that's uh, like a 30 percent of the overall project budget. OK, so it wasn't, it wasn't like this is a 60 million dollar project. This was down around an eight, 10 million dollar project. And so I said, you know, you're going to you're, end up losing a significant amount of money. We need to cancel it. And everyone listened to the numbers. They all went through and they said, no. Nope because we can't suffer the reputation loss. Well, yeah, but I I would argue that there is a tangible success there, but you're defining it, right? You're saying, hey, this is the impact if we go forward. This is the impact if we don't. And then we're going to accept that this is an investment where we're losing money up front and not like a month after we go live, we've already made our money back and we're ROI positive. Um, but what you just said, that conversation is uh, are important conversations to have. And um, I, I, I think when you're having that level of conversation you're at a level of maturity of understanding value and, and investment. And I, I, that's very important. And I think also the part there is the, 
the PMO, again, define your purpose to find out if this is the case. But if you're bringing the information to the discussion and an executive makes a decision, that's their decision based on your, your recommendation or your input or your data. I want to go back, Dustin, you had, as you were talking, it made me think of a large number of our PMOs today are buried inside the IT department, Mm -hmm. but they're running projects across the organization. So those PMO leaders may not be getting access to leadership discussions to understand that their work is impactful and tied to sales and tied to revenue and tied to operations. Yeah. So how, if I'm one of those PMO leaders and I'm listening today, right? And I'm like, man, I, I don't know any of this stuff. They're talking great things, but I don't have access to this. I wish I knew. What can we, how can we help them? If I was that leader, which I have been that leader, I think your first initial step is to go have a conversation with your executive sponsor and say, Hey, this is my vision of what the PMO would be, you know, and maybe it's going to take a few months or horizons a year out to get there. But then you start putting a plan and a roadmap, right? Um, it's, it's so funny. We build projects that could be, you know, a few weeks to a few months to a few years long. And we think about them and we get really tedious of every step that we got to get to be there. But how often do we make a project of developing our PMO? Right. So it's the same thing. You got to, you got to have vision. And that's the other thing. Good leaders have vision, right? They, they see where they need to go in five years. So we get past the two year mark or the four year mark, right? If you don't know where we're going, you know, so, so the first thing is go have that conversation and say, I have the hunger and desire to align our projects with the most important key success metrics of the company. So how can I get more involved there? Right. And, I've never met one executive leader where you had that conversation say, nah, I don't want you to come to these meetings or hear these things or, or be a part of those things. They're going to be ecstatic that you yep. want to do those things. They're going to be, they're going to be like, really? This is great. That sounds awesome. And, and then you said like, we don't have like maybe the forum to talk about the value we're bringing at that level. Right. Um, I, you make the forum. Right. So many times I'm said, Hey, we're not communicating to the whole company about our projects. I'm like, well, why aren't we send the email? Right. Get on the newsletter. Right. Ask to be part of the next company meeting to present the new thing. Right. Like, like I think so many times we think it's a, a complicated task, but really it's just asking. Right. Getting with those mentors and leaders to support you and say, I want to do this. Can we do that? And you'd be surprised asking 99% of the time, they're going to say, yeah, let's figure out a way to do that. And to be successful at that, Dustin, do it in their, in their language, not get rid of that project management talk. Yeah. Right? Back to the point we made earlier, because once you do that, then you start getting by. And if you, if you do it in PM talk, they're going to zero out on you. Get the thousand yard stare real fast. <laughs> right. And, and I'm going to admit, when I started doing some of these things, it's scary. It takes some courage, right? And I'm going to even admit, you know, that there was a time when I looked at executive leaders as these like great, powerful masterminds of things. But, you know, most of everyone puts their pants on one leg at a time, right? They're all people, right? They're all trying to do their best. And they're all doing it based on their knowledge set and their continuous learning, right? So you'd be surprised like how often I just had to say, Dustin, get over yourself and schedule a meeting with your CEO. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. and, 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 the, and then the moment I did it, I was like, wow, that was painless and this was great. And even if the conversation went completely the wrong way that I didn't think I wanted to, I all of a sudden got alignment with an executive leader, right? So a lot exactly. of times we have to get over our own perceptions of – this hierarchy and chain and who I can talk to or can't talk to. I think a lot of us is just us stopping ourselves. Yes, that's a huge problem. Uh, And in many things we do, not just there, but (laughs) in many places, you know, the worst thing they can say is, no, I don't want to have a meeting. So to help us get exposure and and executive alignment and access, but, you know, Todd, I'll, I'll come back to you here with, you know, a lot of PMOs just aren't performing well, right? And we we no. all seen the statistics, right? Two to four years of turnover within that. What's one tidbit or a couple of nuggets that you can leave for the audience of maybe where do you start to try to turn that around? How do you try to fix what's broken? 
The challenge is if it's already broken, it has a pretty bad name, right? It's got the reputation of this is this is a waste. So you, it is significantly harder to fix something that's broken than to build it right the first time. There's a there's just that aura around it, and so it becomes really challenging. I think what you have to do though is to rebuild it with a charter that that speaks to value, and that's the best thing you can do is to to say, okay, what is it we're trying to achieve, and go to achieve it. Put every option on the table, including we're going to ban disband the PMO. B so open and so vulnerable that you say, okay, we'll get rid of my job and we'll just, we'll throw it all away. However, we could also do something else or we could do this. Find out, interview people, understand what they really need, what the problem really is and start addressing that why. And that's your best way to get the turnaround. Uh, But uh, be really honest. It is an uphill battle if you are already considered to be a non-value provided PMO because there's just that aura around it that you're going to have to get past. I think that's totally true, Todd. But also I want to add, if you're in a PMO right now that's failing, don't get so despaired and discouraged that you can turn it around because, you know, a lot like we talk about agile a lot, right? Which is, hey, let's go figure something out. And if it works, it's great, but it's going to change a lot, right? Because we're learning, right? So we're talking about let's adapt a mindset of learning and iteration and change and testing and failing forward and failing fast. We've heard all these things, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you can adapt that to your PMO. We're failing now, but a lot of executive leaderships, if you come to them saying, we're failing, this isn't red, but I want to reinvent it and I want to do this, they're going to get they're going to engage with you. They're going to help you get there and you can turn things around. So often when I think of the things that my PMO is failing about, I just look at it as that's, that's testing that we've tested. So like, for example, we decided to put a little more rigor into building business cases. Right. And, you know, when you start that, you're like, well, these are all the things that are going to be part of our business cases. Right. And some of that stuff worked great. Some of it didn't. And you can't be afraid to f- try something and fail, right? Because at least your wins and successes can be reported back that we tried this and we learned something great and now we're doing that. And that's continuous improvement. Everyone does that. Every um, functional area in your company is always have a continuous improvement efforts. A lot of companies are constantly testing something and learning from it. So don't think that your PMO can't be part of that culture of let's test something and fail and learn and change. And you'd be surprised how how when you become vulnerable and throw up a slide on the screen to all of your steering committee that, hey, we tested this, we learned it doesn't work, and now we're pivoting to that. Everyone has a ton of respect for that. Yes, they do. Yeah. The, the vulnerability is probably one of the most important things that you can do, and it hurts. <laughs> it's a challenge to do that. <laughs> uh, and we had uh, talked about vulnerability on the last show with Judy Umless and uh, and Jason Qualick from Melt Media, and it was a great discussion as well. And I look at my watch and I say, "Man, we've we've hit our time." I, and I think we just started scratching the surface. That we can talk all day about this, and I know our listeners love hearing it. Uh, but unfortunately, we do have a time box. Uh, so Todd and Dustin, thank you so much for being on the show today. I wanted to give you one last opportunity to speak to the listeners and let them know how they can get in touch with you if you have anything upcoming. So Todd, we'll start with you. Well, thank you very much, Joe, for putting this on. This has been great and I've enjoyed it. Um, you know, anybody can get hold of me. Probably the easiest way, the quickest way is on LinkedIn. Um, all of my handles on social media are back from red. Okay, uh, has the the connotation of having a project that's red and bringing it back from red. <laughs> it's kind of my uh, my history. Um, and of course, you can always hit me at Todd Williams, Todd Williams at ecaminc.com uh, in email. So either way works. Uh, I'm open and accept just about everybody. <laughs> so there's a few people I haven't accepted, but that's like two or three out of the six thousand or so that I have connected to me. So, uh, but I love to talk. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on. And uh, Dustin, how about yourself? Oh, same for me. I don't have any really cool handles or anything, but you can find (laughs) me on LinkedIn, Dustin Thompson. 
uh, you know, and uh, I'd love to chat about anything, any discussions as you both, as you, everyone saw today, we're talkers. So we can, we, even if we, I, I'm notorious for getting stuck in the parking lot on the way out of work. And then like 45 minutes later, when I told my wife I was on my way home, I'm not. So uh, feel free to engage and discuss stuff with me. Uh, thanks for having us on. Yeah, my yeah. pleasure. Thank you both. Uh, and thank you, of course, to all the listeners that are helping uh, to make the show be successful. A reminder for everybody, we are live the first and third Thursday each month. In the month of May, we're going to be shifting from 11 a.m. shows to 1 p.m. shows as we're going to be having guests joining us live from Australia uh, for those shows. May 2nd, we'll have Elise Stevens uh, from Australia talking about her hashtag celebrating women in project management initiative that she put on with two of the people that she uh, featured in that, Linda Stanton and Cornelia Homewood, who are both here in the local Phoenix area. And let I plug, I worked with Cornelia Homewood personally, and she's great, and you're going to have a lot of fun with her on the show. That's awesome. And then May 16th, we're going to have Julia Steele, also from Australia, on with Renee Campisi here locally. Uh, also, a reminder, these shows are recorded. We are live now, but we do record and publish these as podcasts. And you can catch Project Management Office Hours on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, whatever your favorite podcast platform are out there. Of course, thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad, home of the Purpose Driven PMO, where we focus on purpose, measure, and optimize. So that's it for now. Office Hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours. Mm-hmm.